When a photojournalist makes the choice to document conflict and the aftermath of conflict, they accept a high level of unpredictability. Recognizing the fact is necessary not only for telling the story, but also keeping yourself and the people around you safe, at least as safe as you can be. You have to be open to all the possibilities. That's a lesson that photographer Sebastian Mayer learned several times over while working and living in Iraqi Kurdistan. For over a decade, he documented the complex political and cultural history of the Kurds, eventually beginning the first Iraqi-based photo agency with his best friend, Kamran Najim. From the very beginning, he had to reconsider what he thought he knew about the people and their history if he was to tell an honest and nuanced story. In, in a way, I'd never worked before because as a photographer, you're very used, as a photojournalist, you're very used to covering events as they happen. And this was, I was photographing an event that had happened over 20 years ago, or exactly 20 years ago. So I was photo, I, I referred to it at the time like photographing ghosts. I was photographing everything that wasn't there. The people who, who had died were, were gone. So I was photographing the survivors and in a way that I, that would translate that story, which is, it was a, a challenge and a, like a really good challenge. The photo agency, which began with just him and Kamran, eventually grew, providing people from the region an opportunity to tell their own stories and share them with the world. Their success included publication in international magazines and awards. But things changed dramatically when Kamran was wounded while covering a brutal skirmish with the terrorist organization ISIS that had come to take control of the region. We'd had an official statement at that point from the Kurdish Peshmerga ministry that Kamran was officially dead. So we were working with local police forces that morning to figure out how to safely access the battlefield and retrieve his body. And while we were figuring that out, his best friend from from growing up, Birwa, got a phone call. And it was Kamran. He wasn't dead. He'd been wounded. The Kurdish forces, Kurdish forces had, with, had retreated, leaving his body on the battlefield, thinking he was dead. But that night, ISIS had gone onto the battlefield and retrieved Kamran, and now he was a, an ISIS hostage. We'll talk to Sebastian about how the fate of Kamran changed his life and how putting together his new book on his decade in Iraqi Kurdistan has helped him to come to terms with one of the most important periods of his life. This is Ibarian X, and welcome back to the Candid Frame. But thanks for making time for me on this Saturday morning. I really appreciate it. You bet. So where, where are you now? Where are you living now? Uh, I'm in New York. I'm in Brooklyn. Okay, how long have you been there now? I moved back. So I grew up in New York. I moved back in 2015, the beginning of 2015. Oh, okay. So, so you've been there a while. So, yeah, about almost five years, four, four and a half, five years. Are you still uh, driving a lot for, for your work? Or are you? Well, no, because of the, well, a couple of things. So I, I moved back uh, to, cause my mom, uh, my mom got sick. So I came back to take care of her oh. and that kept me in New York for, for a while. And then, and I just had a kid seven months ago. So oh, congrats. That, that, <laughs> thanks. It's amazing. But it, uh, that keeps me pretty stationary for the time being. And then obviously with the book, I'm doing a lot of promotion and a lot of events and talks and going to universities and stuff. So that keeps me from traveling, but I will, I'll start again in the new year. Well, well thanks for sending me out the book. I really appreciate uh, having a chance to go sure. through it and, and read it and learn more about you. It's, it's kind of timely, unfortunately. Unfortunately <laughs> for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> But it's 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 a it's a fascinating story as well as just a, really a collection not only of really good photographs but a way of honoring the many many people that you met over those ten years, including your your best friend who you talk about mm -hmm. really beautifully in the in the book. But I wanted to start at two thousand eight in terms of what led you to go to Iraqi Kurdistan in in the first place. So I, I got an assignment, essentially. I mean, not essentially. I got an assignment to go to Iraqi Kurdistan in the fall of 2008. I was working as a freelancer in London, um, working for the national newspapers, working for Getty Images. But I was stuck very much doing very Britain-based and even London-based news. I was 20 
26, 27, 28. And I really wanted to, to go out and do other stuff, but it was very hard to find assignments. And I was lucky enough to meet a British documentary filmmaker who'd been covering the Kurds since the 70s. And he was starting a new project, which was a series of documentaries along with a multimedia project, including photography. So he hired me to, to go out there for six weeks. So that's how I first got introduced. Okay. And what was, what was the idea in terms of what you were going to be doing once you, once you arrived there? Yes. I mean, that's, that was really my, my introduction to Curtis and was really to throw me in, in the most amazing way possible into the story of the Kurds and like what had happened to the Kurds over the last 20, 30, 40 years. My job, the, the project that we were working on was was about Anfal, which is the 1988 genocide that Saddam committed against the Kurds. So my job was to, to do portraits of the survivors that he was interviewing, but also to photograph their villages, the villages that were destroyed, mass graves, human remains. So it was a really intense, really, really, really intense story. In, in a way, I'd never worked before because as a photographer, you're very used as a photojournalist. You're very used to covering events as they happen. And this was, I was photographing an event that had happened over 20 years ago or exactly 20 years ago. So I was photo, I, I referred to it at the time like photographing ghosts. I was photographing everything that wasn't there. The people who, who had died were, were, were gone. So I was photographing the survivors. And in a way that I, that would translate that story, which is it was a, a challenge and a, like a really good challenge. Yeah, and for, and for clarification, that that conflict between uh, Saddam and, and the Kurds is a direct result of the Kurds siding with Iran. Correct. So it's it's uh, it, all of these things are, it are always more complex and than the more you dig into them. But essentially, what happened is. At the towards the end of the Iran Iraq War, which was 1980 to 1988, towards the end, the Kurds or certain Kurdish groups decided to to help Iran. So Saddam saw them as fifth columnists, as as betrayers of the Iraqi state, and so he basically unleashed a, a genocide, a, a collective punishment on the Kurds, and in he called it Anfal, which is from the Quran. It's it means the spoils of war. And he killed up to 180,000 people. And often when I hear about that whole episode from my context uh, here in the States, it's tantamount to the sort of political outcome. The fact that we encourage them to take arms against Saddam and yet abandon them. When well, exactly. I mean, you, you hit on a point that I've been making a lot recently, which is, so that was 1988. In 1991, three years later, Iraq invades Kuwait and America comes to Kuwait's defense with a very large coalition, but defeats Saddam's army very, very easily and has the, the opportunity under H.W. Bush to basically to go all the way to Baghdad, overthrow Saddam and be done with it. But he decides not to. And instead, he calls on the Kurds in the north of Iraq and the Shia in the south. Again, like you just said, to take up arms against Saddam, to have their own uprising, which they both did with the understanding that America would come to their defense. Very similarly to what we've done with uh, the Kurds in Syria against ISIS, just like we did a few weeks ago in Syria, we did to the Kurds in Iraq, and we, they did, you know, they did uh, rise up against Saddam. Saddam retaliated, and America did not come to their defense. You know, again, another massacre, a humanitarian disaster uh, yeah. ensued afterwards. You know, when I was reading up on the history of it, especially recently, understanding that the, the situation of the Kurds goes all the way back to, well, it goes back for a long time, but in terms of recent memory, uh, immediately after World War II, in terms of, you know, when with all the lands were being doled out. You hear you had a well, large... It's actually, it's, it's actually even further back than that. It's World War One. World War One. okay. Yeah, yeah. World War yeah. One. Then when land was being dispersed to different countries, the Kurds, even though they had a huge population, uh, they were left with nothing. So basically their population was basically spread around Iraq, Iran, you know, all these several countries, and they had no mm. really sort of country in which they could completely identi identify with. I mean, a lot of people hear Kurdistan and they think that that's a country, but it's actually just a, an area where a lot of Kurds happen to occupy, but it's still part of, a, of another nation. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you, you hit it, you know, nail on the head was at the end of World War One, the Ottoman Empire controlled mo- most of Middle East and North Africa. Ottoman Empire collapses and the the powers that, if you will, won the First World War got to divide it up. And France took bits of Syria and Lebanon and Britain had control of Baghdad and Basra. And they said, oh, well, we'll take this Kurdish bit here and we'll just put it on the top and we'll call that country Iraq. And then Turkey you know, under Ataturk divided. So just like you said, the Kurds live in, in a region that involves su- southern Turkey, eastern Syria, northern Iraq and western Iran. But there is no actual Kurdish country. There is no Kurdish state. Mm-hmm. There's just an area where a lot of Kurds live divided between these four four countries. So from your perspective, especially going in, does that make it more difficult to tell a story because it isn't about conflicts between nations. It's, it's about a, com- a, a community of people that no one wants to completely own, and own is probably the ba- a bad word for it, but y- y- I hope you know what I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting. Mm-hmm. The fact that they can sort of be parsed as someone else's problem, creating sort of a narrative interest in, in terms of the world of journalism, does it make it that much more difficult? Because it's hard to feel that how the choices of governments impact on, on a large community of people has a direct impact on you know countries like the U.S., for example. I mean, the reality is from a journalistic perspective, it's hard it, at the time, it was, it's hard to get editors to take interest in the story about the Kurds because the Kurds were silent partners with the Americans in 2003 in the war against, against Saddam and the invasion of Iraq. And because they cooperated and because they were there to protect their own interests and their own people, it was not a particularly hot area, if you will, right? It was not, this was not Fallujah, this was not Baghdad, this was not where American soldiers were fighting and and dying. This was a peaceful area that had a terrible, terrible past. But that past doesn't have anything, it doesn't have any impact on what is happening to American soldiers on the ground. So to, to tell an American editor, and more importantly, an American audience, hey, let's talk about the Kurds. Let's talk about what happened to them in 1988. Let's talk about what happened to them in 1991 when we betrayed them. People will say, no, I'm sorry, we're just not interested, right? Mm-hmm. We're interested in what, Amer- what happened to American soldiers in Iraq, but that's not the Kurds. We're interested in what's happened to an American, to American soldiers in Afghanistan, not the Kurds. We're interested in what's happening to our own interests, but not to the interests of this, of this small group. And that honestly, I think in a lot of ways, that's how we ended up where we ended up with our political relationships with the Syrian Kurds Mm -hmm. in the fight against ISIS, because they were silent partners and they were, we could, we could politically use them when it was an advantage to us and then forget them when it was not an advantage. Yeah, it seems like in, in a lot of the coverage, it seems that it's served us, and I speak g- generally, to view the Kurds in terms of story as victims if they were the victims of people we opposed. And Correct. then that sort of would define the narrative for the period of time in which we held interest. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I'm curious to hear from you going in how that perspective evolved and, and changed. Does it, I mean, the, the answer to that question is the reason that I ended up staying and moving there and calling Kurdistan my home for, for almost 10 years. So when I went to Kurdistan, I was aware of the history, right? I was aware of what had happened. And I viewed the Kurds probably the same way that most people who, who know a little bit about the region view the Kurds. The view I had was they are a tough warrior people and who have experienced terrible, terrible atrocities, which is totally true. But it was a very, when I got there and saw actually what Erbil, the capital looked like, what Suleimania, the city of almost a million and a half people, what that looked like, I was shocked. I was like, wait, hold on, whoa, whoa, hold on a second. These people eat pizza? These people like iPhones? These people hate traffic jams? Like, what? You know, it, I had, I had, put in my mind through 
20 or 30 years of imagery that I'd seen of the Kurds, which was mass graves or the Peshmerga fighting mm-hmm. or mountain villages, I wasn't prepared for human beings that were like literally no different from myself, right? People want to drive a nice car. People want to like, they like electricity and they're not getting enough and they are annoyed by it. You know, they like their food to be tasty. I mean, like all this kind of stuff that I realized that as a journalist, I was, if I wasn't careful, I would be doing too, which is to paint people from different countries, different cultures, different whatevers, paint them only highlighting the things that separate us as opposed to the things that, that, that make us all human. Yeah. Which is why I, when I got there and met Kamran on that assignment, we became like immediate friends, but he introduced me to all these other Iraqi Kurdish photojournalists who were amazing and who had these incredible pictures of Iraq, of Kurdistan that I'd never seen because I'm, as an American, the only views I'd seen of Iraq were taken by American, French, South African, Japanese photographers. I hadn't seen any photographs by Iraqi photographers, right? It was always a foreign view of Iraq. No one, I'd never seen a view of Iraq from the inside. And so when I saw their photographs, I was like, oh, wait, hold on a second. We are missing, like our visual record of Iraq is just wrong. It's just not right. So the next year when Kamran, I was back in London, because that's where I was living, Kamran told me he had this idea to start a photo agency. I just literally bought a one-way ticket and moved back to start it with him. Because I was like, this is, this is an amazing opportunity. That, that friendship is really integral to your entire period there and is sort of the spine under which you know, the, the, the book is, is put together. To tell us about your, your friendship with him. Because uh, you, know, you certainly worked together. You both had a passion for, you know, for photography, for photojournalism, photojournalism um, and telling stories. But there seems to have been, you know, basically you guys were like brothers from different mothers. Yeah. And tell me about him and what made the whole dynamic between the two of you so special. You know, when you go, I don't know, like you go to, to a new school for the first time and you just meet somebody and you just like, you immediately hit it off. Yeah. And you're like, that's it. Like we're best friends. And it could be an elementary school. It could be a middle school, whatever. It was like that. Like Kamran and I met like my second week there on that, on that first assignment. And he smoke spoke us like a few words of English that he'd picked up in school. I spoke no words of Kurdish. And despite that, you know, that first meeting, basically his boss and my boss were having lunch. We went along and these were like just in our view, cause we were young and just obnoxious. We we're like, these guys are all boring farts. Let's go <laughs> sit at a table and just like look at some photographs together. So we whipped open our laptops and again, with like zero shared language, we just talked for about an hour and a half. Right. And I just, I loved being around him. It was just always, it was always fun. Like it was always just an, everything was like a, was an adventure. Things actually did eventually become uh, like adventures. Like mm. we did do some 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 crazy traveling together. But even when we were just walking through the through the market, through the bazaar, it was like everything was just super fun. I found out once we'd become good friends for a long time, it wasn't just that Kurdish people had this amazing ability to talk with each other. I just assumed it was a Kurdish thing that everyone could call anybody a brother and that you could just jump into conversation. And it, it wasn't that Kamran just was had this like devastating charisma. Like he could, there was no checkpoint. He couldn't walk, talk himself through. Mm-hmm. There was no situation. He couldn't just, just by talking, he could do extraordinary things. And that really was, you know, in a, in a way how we were able to build the agency so well. But back to your question about the friendship, it was just, like the meeting of two of two minds. It was just a, a beautiful thing. And so when I moved there the following year and we started to live together, it was like, <laughs> it's like you just added, you just added fuel to the fire, right? Like it was just, it was like college, but no homework or homework that you wanted to do classes that you wanted to attend. So we'd be up all night, you know, working, building the agency, building the website. It just, everything was super like Tons of hard work, but also tons of fun. And over the years, he and I spent so much time together that our friends, whether they were American friends or Kurdish friends, would sometimes call, would call us by the other one's name. Like I'd walk in a room and people would be like, oh, hey, Kamran. And like, we kind of looked the same, but like not really, <laughs> really looked the same. But they were so used to seeing us together that yeah. we sort of became indistinguishable. And his family, uh, his mom and, and his brother just started referring to me as, as their brother because I was there 
Tom and I were just like attached at the hip. Yeah. What's interesting about the the agency that you guys created is that it it started with just the two of you, but eventually you incorporated a lot of other people who were from from the country, Mm -hmm. uh, and they and trained them on how to be photojournalists. And many went on to to have really amazing careers and win awards. And I, I think what's kind of fascinating is having the opportunity not only for you to sort of teach them what you knew, but also learning from them. Because I think that the fact that their photo education and their life experience was so dissimilar to yours, that somehow that there was this cross-pollination that was happening. And we mentioned in the beginning of the conversation about how your perspective was so shaped by Western you know, perspective and and that sort of thing. And I'm wondering how working with them helped you to develop your own sense of creating images, especially when it came to telling stories. It's a great, that's a great question. There's there's a lot, there's a lot that I learned. I think on the more, on the more serious side, there's not a single friend of mine or photographer in the agency who hasn't been a refugee at least twice in their life. And there's not a single person I know who hasn't lost a really close family member through everything that's happened in, in Iraq since they were, since they were born. Mm-hmm. And so that, when, when you think about it, is a very sobering, a very sobering thought that their life experience and what they'd been through, what, they, what they'd lived through, war, hunger, like really like to I mean like not having enough to eat, yeah. which is a crazy concept for me, honestly, as an American, the idea that you know, you, 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 there's, there's just no options for food. You're going to starve to death. Um, you're going to walk miles through the snow because otherwise someone's going to kill you. That they'd all lived through that. And they'd yet, they'd maintained that they're the way that they were in the world meant that we could be friends, that we were not alienated and different and separated that despite everything they'd been through, they still were warm and, encouraging and accepting and hospitable, not judgmental or distanced from someone from a different country who'd grown up with in a, in a, in a almost alarmingly uh, privileged way compared to them. I think that it was a very, really important, just on a human level, very humbling. From a photographic side, it's really obvious, right? Like they're Kurdish and they lived in Kurdistan, so they knew what was going on, right? Like, if I wanted, if I, we wanted to go do a story about X, Y, or Z, they knew where that story was, or more importantly, they knew what the stories were, right? Like they knew what was happening along the border with Iran. They knew, you know, about the gun smuggling. They knew about the oil trade. I mean, they, they knew everything. So I got to learn about Kurdistan through them. And I got to learn what, you know, the visual side of Kurdistan through them. Yeah, so much of what I, when I hear people talk about photojournalism, maybe not in the moment that it's out in a magazine or a newspaper, in afterwards, it's often about the aesthetics of the photographs. And I'm wondering whether being around these these other photographers, both men and women, how that shifted or maybe changed the way that you looked at photographs, whether or not they were telling a story. That is a great question. I tell you, there's something that really changed in my in the in my visual underst- uh, look at Kurdistan. It was about humor, right? There mm. really a lot of the things that I photographed, both intentionally because I was looking for them, or unintentionally, but they were just there staring you in the face. Were, were tragic, what, you know, mass graves, suicide bombs, uh, portraits of people who'd lost family members, all like really like very, very heavy stuff. But despite all of that, my Kurdish friends maintained an incredible sense of, of, of humor and the things that they found funny, not to laugh at, you know, not to not to point you know finger and laugh at, but to, to be in on the joke. I think that is that was a big part of my you know, visual education in Kurdistan. And I include it you know, very intentionally in the book. There are some photographs where you stop and you you laugh. I mean, I've shown the book to people and like, as they're going through it, I hear them chuckle. Mm. And that for me is like one of the biggest wins because it means that a, like I can tell a joke, which is like, (laughs) it's someone who wants to be funny. Like it's always good when the joke lands, but it's a Kurdish joke that I'm telling and people are in on it. And like, that's, that, that's a, as a 
you know, somewhat of a cultural translator, right? I'm bringing a, a book that is, it's, it's 50, I mean, all, anything I write in English, I've written in Kurdish there. So it's, it's meant for a Kurdish audience as much as a non-Kurdish audience. But if people in America are laughing at my Kurdish jokes, that means that I'm, I'm, I'm a decent <laughs> translator too. Um, the book span tends 10 years and you talk about in the introduction about you had had an idea of publishing a, a book early on, but that 10 years later, it really got transformed into something completely different. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that evolution. So the initial plan was to, was in reaction to my first impression of Kurdistan when I got there, right? So my first impression of Kurdistan was the, you know, the, the impoverished Kurds who were tough warriors and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I realized that Kurdistan had a lot of natural beauty and that it had a lot of poets and there was a, a, a sort of a, a suburban boring life that was happening as well, which we have in America that's has been photographed well in the past. And I thought, well, we should include this as well. And it was going to be very much a deep nuanced visual record of Kurdistan and really nothing. It wasn't going, it, it, it was deep and, but maybe that was where it, it was going to stop. It wasn't going to go any further. Where things changed is is where my life turned, and it's a very it's a horrendously tragic turn. But I, I was in Kurdistan when when it was on the rise, right? I was there when it was it was very peaceful. Economic development was skyrocketing. Oil was being discovered in pumps. Uh, oil execs were having gated communities built for them, five star hotels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then in 2014, ISIS shows up in, you know, in the northern region of Iraq and everything just changes. Kurdistan gets thrown back into war, a war that it really felt that it had been able to, to avoid. And on June 10th, ISIS overruns the city of Mosul. And two days later, Kamran went to cover the frontline fight between the Kurdish forces and ISIS outside the city of Hawija. And he was shot. And... I was, my, I was about seven hours away working on another assignment when I found out. I got a call saying that he was, he'd been shot and killed. So I drove all the way back, you know, uh, seven hours through the night to back to Sulaymaniyah where our office was. And the next morning, about five, six o'clock in the morning, me, two of his brothers and a few friends drove to Kirkuk to retrieve his body from the battlefield. Because the Kurds, during the battle, the Kurds had, had with, um, fallen back. They'd retreated. We'd had an official statement at that point from the Kurdish Peshmerga ministry that Kamran was officially dead. So we were working with local police forces that morning to figure out how to safely access the battlefield and retrieve his body. And while we were figuring that out, his best friend from, from growing up, Birwa, got a phone call. And it was Kamran. He wasn't dead. He'd been wounded. The Kurdish forces... Kurdish forces had with had retreated, leaving his body on the battlefield, thinking he was dead. But that night, ISIS had gone onto the battlefield and retrieved Kamran, and now he was a, an ISIS hostage. So we we immediately ran to the Kurdish commander and told him the news, and he we gave him the phone number of his of the ISIS captor because that's how Kamran called. He called from his captor's phone, and the negotiations started, and they went. They went, they went wrong. And um, ISIS just hung up the phone eventually and turned off the phone and there was no way to, to, um, to get through. So we had to leave Kirkuk. We went back to Sulaymaniyah about an hour away. And in our, the metrography office, in the agency office, we set up a, a contingency room and started to work for his release. And, you know, running down all the different leads that we could find, we had journalists who had incredible intel inside the city of Hawija, where ISIS was. We had politicians working for us. We had the um, Kurdish uh, Secret Service. They were, um, or um, not Secret Service, but the, the intelligence service. Mm -hmm. We were working with them to try to track down leads and, and intel. This, this happened June, June 12th, and then June turned into July, turned into August, September. And unfortunately, it's now been five and a half years and um, all of our leads have, have dried up and we haven't found Kamran. That was a really, my life completely, completely changed. So 
for all of 2014 and much of 2015, I, I didn't work. I put my camera down because I'd thrown myself into this, into this rescue operation. But after a, about, it was probably about a, a full 12 months, full year of me working nonstop on this, I, the leads had dried up to a point where um, I wasn't needed on a day-to-day basis. So mm-hmm. I went back to work. Then I went back to work on, on this book. And what had happened was Kurdistan had completely changed, right? Now, Kurdistan was a country or region at war the way it hadn't been when I had uh, arrived in 2008. And I had changed, right? I had, I had gone there in 2008 to photograph victim, people, who, people who'd lost loved ones during a genocide. I'd photograph people who'd lost loved ones um, because of a civil war. And now I was, I, I wasn't Kurdish. I hadn't lived through, through what they'd lived through, but I had also now lost someone incredibly close to me. So my perspective on Kurdistan had changed. I was, I could really feel that sense of loss, that sense of sadness. Mm-hmm. So my book started to focus on that. Yeah, I was photographing nature. Yeah, I was photographing daily life. But I was focusing a lot of my journalistic and photojournalistic uh, energy on the family members of people who of people who'd lost their family members and spending more time than I would be able to on an assignment, getting to know families better, going to not just to the this, the going with them to the to the grave site of their loved one, which I did, but then also going with them to their, uh, to their graduation ceremonies, you know, spending days, weeks with them, hanging out at their houses, getting to know them and, and getting a real journalistic understanding of, of grief Mm -hmm. and loss in Kurdistan. A few people have let me know that they've had difficulty contributing to the show via PayPal or Patreon. I have double checked the links and they each seem to be active. However, I suggest that you either try Chrome or Firefox. And if you're using Safari or any other browser and you're still having problems, please let me know. Uh, You can email me at ibarianx at thecandidframe.com. And if you haven't already, please consider supporting the show by becoming a Patreon supporter. By contributing only $5 or more a month, you help us to do the work that ensures that we can do this, that we can provide you great conversations like the one you're listening to today. Visit patreon.com forward slash the candid frame and become a Patreon supporter today. Thanks. You know, what's, what's interesting with, with the story is that when you first went there, part of it was trying to tell the narrative of what had happened 20 years afterwards. And a big part of that story for a lot of families was not knowing what was the final outcome of happened to their family members, to their loved ones, because of the mass graves and just the abductions. And th- there was no closure, if there can be any closure. And to some degree, you experienced that yourself with, with Kamran. And yeah. how does how is how is that having literally the same experience of 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 of, of not having sort of the final period at the end of the sentence? How, I know it, it impacts you personally, but also how does it impact the way you choose to work? So it's, it's a really important and really really lovely question. So there's a term for people who experience something like a hostage crisis that doesn't, that doesn't resolve itself. Uh, the term is ambiguous loss and it was coined by a, an American therapist from Minnesota. And it's, it's a, it's a fantastic phrase for anyone who has a, who experiences it because it really in two very simple words really gets across the sensation of what it's like. It's, you know, loss without closure, ambiguous loss from the personal side, how I, how I dealt with that, or what does it feel like? Or it, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to to move on. It's very because you can't say goodbye. Her advice as a therapist is to somehow somehow find meaning in the ambiguous loss, which is a crazy thing to to ask of somebody. How do you find meaning in this very painful, ambiguous place? 
there are many different ways. I think some people who go through it get involved in, in, in NGOs or social work or things like that. I found a creative outlet. I poured myself in, into this book in, and trying to tell that, that story. That was my way of, of or one of the ways that I dealt with it was to, was to turn a creative eye to this, to this situation, which segues into your other question, which is how has this, this hostage situation, this ambigu- ambiguous loss uh, affected me or, or channeled me cr- creatively. And I think what it did, I, it's hard for me to reflect on myself to know how it sort of, if you will, from, from the outside, mm-hmm. be, I'd, I'd need to ask like my wife or an editor or someone be like, oh yes, his work changed in these ways. But really for me, I think what it did is it made me work harder. Uh, there was more, there was more at stake because it was more important for me to get the story right. And by the story, I mean the sensation, the feeling. When you read my book, both when you read the images and you read the words, if I've done my job well, you will have left with an understanding, with an impression that is both artistic and, and emotional of that ambiguity mm-hmm. of, that I experienced. You, me, the author of the book you're reading, but also the characters in it, the other people that I photographed in the book. A couple of years ago, I think in 2017, you published uh, uh, an article and the photos about a small community here in the States that had experienced an economic downturn. And uh, it really is sort of representative of so much that's happening in, in, in this country. And I really would love to hear how all this experience that you had had uh, overseas, not not so much change, but... What, what, what did, how did it shape the approach that you took to telling a story in a, in, in a country and in a place that was much more familiar to you mm-hmm. than, you know, than Curtis was? So in a lot of ways, it's very similar in the sense that I've never, I'd, I've never reported it in as, an, as a national reporter. Like I've never covered the U.S. before. Not entirely true. I started off my career working for the New York Sun, but I was photographing the real estate section of the newspaper. So mm-hmm. I'll give that as a, a technical aside. So this was in 2017. We'd had, you know, Donald Trump was elected and the world's and more importantly, America, America's media had decided to go to Rust Belt America and to tell the story of all these people who voted for Trump and to explain to all of us who live on the coasts and who can't possibly understand how that could have happened. And it was a very, again, I felt, and I think a lot of us felt that that reporting was very two dimensional, it was very simplistic. It made me curious to go see for myself as a journalist, right? I, I wanted to go and, and get a better understanding. And so I went to this, this town in, in Ohio, Coshocton and spent two weeks there which is not 10 years that I spent in Kurdistan, but it's, it was longer than, than one normally gets to do on an assignment like this. And I thank my editor at BuzzFeed for giving me the opportunity to, to spend that amount of time and, and do that work. Because what I found when I got there was, again, what I, what, I, what I saw when I got to Kurdistan, which is the story is not as simplistic as here are some white working class people who no longer have jobs and they're angry and so now they're going to vote for Trump, right? I saw a care in the community that I had never really seen or experienced in America before. I saw people who, I, it was not about politics. These are, this, this is a, it was a town that had lost a lot of work, but it was a town that really, that really cared for, its, for each other. It was, people went out of their way in ways that I think my liberal instincts and my friends' liberal instincts wish that we would all care for each other, but these people are actually doing it in ways that I don't do and my friends don't do. And so I got, I, I was able, I'm sort of rambling here a little bit, but what I, what I tried to do was to give, as I tried in Kurdistan, a, a more subtle and nuanced portrayal of the town, which lives in the gray areas, gray areas. And we all know that journalism has always, but increasingly feels like a black and white issue. We need right. clickbaity headlines. We need you to like care. It needs to be shocking. And even, even when it's like long form, it can feel that way. And what I learned honestly 
through my time in Kurdistan as just as a journalist, this is before Kamran was kidnapped, but then living through the ambiguity of, of his kidnapping is that, that John Keats, a negative capability, basically the best artists in the world are the ones that can live in uncertainty and ambiguity comfortably. So if I can, as a photographer, create a nuanced piece that makes you stop and think where there's nothing shocking, nothing blows your head off. There's no, you know, there's no, there's no, there's no needle sticking out of anybody's neck, but it's slower and, and, but it draws you in and piques your curiosity. Then, then I'm doing the job that I want to be doing. Yeah. Work that's absolute is, uh, doesn't hold your attention for very long. No. Yeah. No, it's good at the time and it's good on the 30 year anniversary. And like, that's it. Right. Like right now we're seeing amazing, amazing images of the fall of the Berlin Wall, which is a really important and extraordinary event. But none of this 30 year anniversary photography that I'm seeing gets gives me any understanding of the the divide in Germany. Yeah. Right. You know, there's nothing there's nothing more more subtle or in depth or, you know, like, you know, when when you see a really, really great movie and you're like. I don't know how to feel. I feel this way and then yeah. I feel that way. And we, we have to be able to do the thing. If, that, if they, people can do that with the moving image, we have to be able to do that with the still image. But it can be a difficult thing because trying to sell basically is what we're trying to do. These stories that are much more nuanced, that are much more subtle in an age in which people's attention are, are, are measured by the, how long it takes them to swipe their finger from right to left. Uh, it, it really makes it difficult to not only sell it to the reader or the viewer, but also the people who are choosing to allocate space for it, whether it's on a printed page or an electronic one. Um, so it, it has to be really a practical decision for you as a photojournalist in terms of, okay, what do you pursue and how hard do you push on some of these things? Because you still have to make a living. So how, what's that like for you? I think what you, what you end up doing, because you, you're absolutely right, you have to... I have to come up with stories that my editors want to pay me to do. So I can't come up with, Hey, check out this amazing nuanced story that no one's going to read because that's <laughs> not going to fly. You, I think you have to do kind of what I did or not. You had to, what I do is I allocate the time and my own resources to make a book like the one I made. Hopefully it doesn't take another 10 years to do another book, but you know, you never know. Usually the first one is the hardest. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, 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 I, uh, yes, I hope so. Fingers crossed. <laughs> in, and I mean, the way that, that I did, so obviously photo book publishing is a, it, and, and photo journalism, photo book publishing is a, is a, a very non-lucrative uh, pursuit. You, you raise the funds however you raise the funds. Most people do Kickstarter. Um, I did a bunch of commercial work and just kept the money to the side until I was ready to print. And I think that's how you do it. You have to do it. If you're going to tell a story on your own terms in subtlety, depth and length, you have to do it on your own. And hopefully the work is good enough and strong enough that it will speak for itself after the fact. Yeah. Uh, one of the interesting things in terms of the process of the book was that you made four by six prints of the images you wanted to consider and that you shared them with other people and they would like write signatures on the winds they liked and that allowed you to sort of parse it. And, I, and that's, that's a practice that I always recommend people to do when they're trying to edit images down and try to cull them down. But I'm curious as to who you chose to share the images with because that's as, as important as the images that you initially choose yourself. Completely agree. So it was a process that actually my book, my publisher's, came up with so it was so i my book's published by red hook editions which is a small imprint based out of here out here in brooklyn so it's jason eskenazi who's a brilliant brilliant photojournalist peter van Achmel, alan chin they started it each one of them is you know phenomenal photojournalists who i love and trust their work and their decisions and through their network we picked a few other photographers to come in and sit in on on the edit I brought in 500 four by sixes and then we just passed them. We literally sat around a circular table and passed them around. And at the end we tallied up which signature, which photographs got the most signatures, which, you know, you know, six signatures, five signatures, four. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as mathematical 
in the end. But what that gave me was an understanding of which, which images were striking a chord and which images were not. And okay. there were plenty that struck a chord that I wasn't sure that would. And there were plenty that I loved to pieces and I wanted in there that I was told just from an outsider perspective, from an editor's perspective, that photo shouldn't be nowhere near the book. Stop thinking about that photograph and move on. And that was just the initial process. And then, then comes the sequencing. And again, I worked with, with uh, Jason a lot in particular and, and Peter. Um, I mean, they've, Jason's made, I mean, Jason's Wonderland book is just a, I mean, it's a masterclass in, in, in photo book publishing. And then Peter as well. I mean, his books, uh, Disco Night 9-11 and Buzzing at the Sill, the sequencing of those is brilliant. So I really trusted them. And then you sit there, you know, stand there with your big metal board and your magnets and the photos get moved around and lines and stories and pacing, like, like, a, like, a, like a good podcast, like mm -hmm. a good story that starts to go in. And what was very interesting was as a photographer, especially someone who, who had spent so much time with these images as I had, I, I had like, it was like, I had no taste, like I had no perspective. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sure you know this mm -hmm. very well. Like you just, it, it, it's, it's a little bit different from, from writing. I mean, I've had my, my writing edited and paragraphs will get moved around and, you know, whole ideas that want to be in a story are cut out. But at the end of the day, you, the, the author, you still have to write the words. Like you still, even after the edit, you still have to like figure it out with photography. You can be so deaf and blind to it that you need other photographers to really, really lead you, uh, into the sequencing. Cause I, I, thankfully I had an amazing, amazing publishers who could do that for me. Do you think that so much of what you were seeing up on that wall was your life? It wasn't just images that you had created on various assignments. This is 10 years of your life that you were seeing up there. Did that make the process more difficult, more challenging to do? Absolutely. Like 100 that's, that's all I saw up there was my life. And that was, that was what gave me emotional attachment to certain images, right? It's like why director's cuts suck, right? Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like a director, he knows that, he, that, that, that like, I don't know, a million dollars of his budget went into this one shot. So he, that shot needs to be in the movie, but it objectively doesn't. And so that's why you, the editor takes it out. I knew that this, you know, there'd be a picture, you know, let's say a very poignant picture of Cameron that was really important to me that I wanted in there. But the reason I wanted it in there is because it evoked a memory that was important to me. Not that the image itself told the story to the, to the audience. Mm -hmm. And that's where my editors were, were, were brilliant because they'd be like, no, that picture does not tell the story you think it does. It, t it tells it to you because you were there. You, you remember the smells, you remember the this, but no, it doesn't, it, the, the image itself doesn't tell that story. So yeah, that it was, it was a lot of this process. If you, there's, there's the pure artistic, journalistic storytelling aspect to this book, which is what I put out. But obviously as a creator, there's my story of making the book. Mm -hmm. And without really drumming home a cliche or, uh, you know, this, this does close a chapter on my life, right? Like this is 10 years that I spent living and working in Kurdistan. And with the publication of this book, that chapter, that period of my life is now has, has, has a, does not have ambiguity is clearly, you know, there's a, there's a period at the end of that sentence. Yeah. There's, there's an interesting choice that's made in this book. And that's specifically with when you address the issue of Cameron and the story of Cameron. Those sections turn into um, not full color images, but monochrome images. Uh, there's a difference in the color of the, uh, the paper, maybe even the, maybe even the texture of the paper. Tell me about the choice to do that as opposed to putting that section in the beginning, at the end of the book, and not differentiating it visually from every, all the other content. So that was, yeah, as you, as you could tell, it's a super, you know, very clear decision that we made. Um, so yeah, it is, it's a completely different paper stock. All the pictures are black and white. All the other pictures in the book are color. It's right smack dab in the middle of the book. So it, there's a couple of different choices that were made there. First of all is I personally don't like photo books that have words that are mixed in with the, with the photographs. It's not entirely true. I found a few photo books recently that I think 
tie the photography and the words together brilliantly. But in general, when I'm looking at the photos, I want to be looking at the photographs. And then when I have to stop and read even like a poem or a short paragraph or I, I get, I get thrown off. So I thought I'm going to, I'm going to give the viewer the option to go through and look at all the photographs. And then there'll be this written section, which they may or may not be in the mood to read, but they can come back to it later or they can start with that and look at the photographs next. But I want to be very clear that the, that the, the reading can happen all on its own which is why there are photographs that are laid out in that middle section, but they are short and they're more like snapshots and they're, they're images that you can glance over very quickly. They're more reference pictures than deep, you know, photojournalism. So that's why I wanted to stand out. Now, the reason to put it in the middle of the book was to give you that feeling that through the, while you're looking at the pictures in the first half of the book, there's a story developing and then all of a sudden, right, slam, yeah. something happens. And that's exactly, you know, what, what it was like for me uh, working, both on, I mean, just be, being there. So I wanted to have that visual shock yeah. of, wait, different paper, different, what's, something's different, what's going on here? And then you can choose, again, you can skip over that and then keep looking at the color pictures in the other half of the book, or you can stop, read the essay, and then continue. But the, those were those were the the decisions that I made. Yeah, I, th I think it was a wonderful choice. I really enjoyed having that distinction of that section, not just because of the content, but just because I see something different happening in the terms of what what's possible with a book that's dedicated to photography. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it can be just so uniform in terms of the approach that a lot of people takes, and it's just like it's mm -hmm. another it's another way of being creative. But a lot of people sometimes are very reluctant to, you know, to make the leap. And I'm glad that you guys did, and I think it's very very effective. Thanks. Yeah, I mean there there are there are colleagues of mine who've made books that involve, you know, scans of of, of items of ephemera that came along the you know, along the way, or that, um, they use drawings or they, you know, they use all these other different visual things, which I have seen work so brilliantly. I'm a little bit I don't know, less creative. I was like, I'm going to work with words and photographs and nothing else. Yeah. So I don't have all that other, you know, those other things that my, my other colleagues have used. Um, but I'm glad I'm, it makes me very happy to hear that you liked it. You know, the, the your time in that 10 year period was really kind of interesting. You know, you have an opportunity to leave London and go to Kurdistan. You do it. You want to mm -hmm. start a photo agency? Hey, let's go and do it. I mean, it was just a lot of like really all not, not literally spontaneous, but you, you sort of get my, you mm -hmm. get my gist because you know, mm -hmm. when you're young, you have an opportunity, you sort of just jump at it. You know, the right. book is sort of the culmination of that, but now it's like you're older, you're fa a, new, a new father now. Um, mm -hmm. All these things that have occupied your life are really largely behind you now. So in terms of looking forward, are you still inclined to sort of see things in the same way in terms of what you want to pursue with the sort of aggressiveness that uh, represented your, your early career? Wow, I, I, didn't, I didn't know it was aggressive, but I'll take it. <laughs> um, for me, for me, really, like the the the, the change, as you said, is, is is you know I I've got a kid now, um, so there's a lot of just being around my child that I want to do. But in terms of my my work and sort of what what's next, in in some ways, I'm just going to keep being me and doing the work that that comes naturally to me. And I think that the work that comes naturally to me has always been based in curiosity, right? Like it's the one thing that has always driven me to do anything. And my, even my early work when I was, you know, a, a, a newspaper beat, you know, photographer in a small local paper in the North of England, I was just, if something piqued my curiosity, I just sort of went after it and, you know, scratch and scratch and mm -hmm. scratch and scratch and scratch and scratch. And I think that's, that's what, what the next thing is. I will continue to do paid photojournalism work because I do paid photojournalism work, <laughs> but in terms of the stuff that really, that really, um, interests me, I imagine that it will not be too dissimilar. I think it'll have, it, it'll be, it'll be quiet. Like you won't, it won't be beating you over the head with stuff. 
Um, it'll have humor in it because I always, it, if it doesn't have humor in it, then I feel like I, you've, you've missed it. Like if you, it, if you haven't slowed down enough where a joke can, has the possibility of landing, then you're not, you're not going slow enough. What, what that, what that thing is, I don't know. I'm, when you finish wrapping up a book, unless you are a insane creative person and I'm only a mildly insane creative person, <laughs> like you, I, I, I don't have another book in mind yet or another project in mind. But it'll it'll happen because it it always has a tendency to happen, and I'll just wherever that curiosity takes me, that's where I'm going. Right. Well, my last question that I ask each guest is: I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore on their own, and it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So, who would that one photographer be, and why? So, I would recommend people find my colleague Ben Brody's new book. He has created a book. It's called Attention Service Member. It is one of the most intense and brilliant photo book reads I have ever experienced. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of book where it combines visuals, words that has, you have foreshadowing, you have backshadowing, you've got, you, you move through the book left to right, but you find you're going yourself going right to left. You look at an image and then 50 pages later, there's something written that makes you totally rethink that image from 50 pages before. Um, oh, wow. It's, it is, is attention service member, Ben Brody. I, I literally can't recommend it highly enough. It was shortlisted for the Aperture First Book Award and it was like unbelievably well-deserved. I think it's a brilliant book. Oh, great. Well, Sebastian, thank you for your time and your generosity. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. This, is, I, this has been really enjoyable. Thank you. Thanks to Sebastian for sharing his time and story. Find out more about him and his work by visiting sebmayer.com. You can also find his book under every yard of sky, wherever books are sold. But please consider using our Amazon affiliate as it helps to support the show. I have two upcoming workshops, the first in Los Angeles next weekend at the Los Angeles Center of Photography, and I have two slots left, and in Tokyo, Japan in December. You can find out more by visiting nobechicreatives.com for my workshop in Tokyo and lacphoto.org for my workshop in Los Angeles. You can also support the show by writing a review wherever you listen to podcasts. And even better, if you really enjoy an episode, spread the word via an email to a friend, a post on your social networks, or word of mouth. It makes all the difference. So thank you for your support and being part of the TCF community. And check out our YouTube channel where I offer comments on photography submitted by TCF listeners who contribute to the Candid Frame Flickr poll. Check out the TCF Flickr poll and our YouTube channel by clicking on the link in the show notes and the website. My latest book, Making Photographs, Developing a Personal Visual Workflow, is now available. You can purchase it today and receive 40% off the list price when you order it from the Rocky Nook website. Use the promo code PORELLO40 at checkout to take advantage of the discount. And receive three free copies of my previously published ebooks by signing up for the Candid Frame mailing list, where I share thoughts about life, photography, and keep you updated on TCF events. And remember, you can support the show by contributing to our Patreon effort or donating through PayPal. Now, not all episodes may be available on your podcast app of choice. So to download, listen, and share any and all episodes of the Candid Frame, download the TCF app, available for both Apple iOS and Android. And because of your support, it's free. The Candid Frames audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame.